<coughs> we want to say greetings to everyone and thank you all for being here today. <coughs> it's always a blessing to be able to come to you and share the word of the Lord with you. And uh, yesterday as I was looking over the word and studying, <coughs> the Lord started dealing with me about putting him first in our marriages. And of course, you know, when you uh, think about putting him first in our, in our marriage, it also is talking about our life as well. Uh, if you can put God first in your marriage, you can... Uh, I think marriage is what the test is, the litmus test, especially for everything else. Um, we grow up, and at different ages, we wonder who it is that we're going to marry, who we'll spend the rest of our lives with. We see marriages, we see people get married, we go to weddings. And then we also see people get divorced. And in the back of our minds, we are rehearsing what has gone on or what has gone wrong in the different marriages that we have seen fall apart, even in different relationships. And so we vow in our, within ourselves that we're going to do whatever it takes to make our marriage work. And we'll even adopt that that say, you know, God is first in my marriage. But do we really know what that means to put God first in our marriage, in our relationships, and in our lives? Mm. A lot of times we think of uh, putting God first, meaning I'm going to go to church, I'm going to do my religious duties, I'm going to pray, I'm going to praise him. And so he's first. But notice what, what the term is saying. Putting God first. It don't mean, it's not just saying having a relationship with God or including God in your life. It's a completely different situation to have a relationship with God and to put him first. Those are two different things. Amen. Judas had a relationship with the Lord. Oh yeah, they they had a relationship. They were Judas wasn't off to the side. You know, those three and a half years he walked with the Lord, they had a relationship. But you know what else? Judas also had a price. You see? So the Lord wasn't first in his life. Money was. Covetousness was. You see that? And so we have to be careful when we, when we uh, are talking about things like that, putting God first. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I think that's a great point you brought out um, about the relationship because if we think about it, we have a lot of relationships, you know, in different areas of our lives, whether it be with coworkers, um, family, different friends. Um, we have relationships maybe with teachers, professors, um, whatever the case. But we can certainly identify who's on the top of our priority list when it comes to relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a, a really good point you make that we better make sure um, God is at the top and that he's number one, that he's first in everything. Um, amen. Amen. So when we're talking about putting God first, it means that when everything else is failing around us, that, that God will still be there for, uh, by our own choice. Mm -hmm. Many people, they start off serving God. So I'm going to tell you, some of the most bitter people you'll ever meet are people who served God at one time. Things happened and went the way that they didn't want them to go right. in their lives. And they blame God for it, and now they're bitter. Why? Because God was not first. God was there as long mm -hmm. as everything is going right in my life. And, uh, you know... Right. And things like that. And so, putting God first means when everything else has fallen around us, that He's still there. That we won't allow anything to separate us mm -hmm. from God. Now, part of the problem in 
marriages especially, is that people, they fight for their marriage under the guise of putting God first. And trust me when I tell you, the devil will test you to see whether or not God is really first. You see that? And many people have failed that test. I've seen it firsthand on many occasions. People say, I put God first. But when the husband or the wife go in left field, I'm going to follow right behind them. No, you're not putting God first, you see. And, and, and God's not first in your marriage. He has to be first, you see, not second to your spouse. Not second to anything else. You know, when I was growing up, there was this, um, there was a license plate, you know, that people would wear, uh, that people would have on their cars that said, God is my co-pilot. And I always thought that that was error because God is not anybody's co-pilot. Yes, right. He's not anybody co-anything. Yeah. And so God is, you're not flying a plane and God's not on side of you making sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Either God is driving and in complete control or he's not, he doesn't have anything to do with it. You see that? And that's the way it has to be in our, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our lives. God has to be in complete control, you see. And it's unfortunate that so many um, believers, uh, so-called believers, are living shallow lives when it comes to Christianity. And you've heard my wife say, because I've asked this question, and you've heard her repeat, you know, what I've said about, what have you ever given up for God? You, we say all day long, I gave my life to the Lord. Hmm. Do you know what that means? No, just say what, what really happened. That you walked the aisle and shook the preacher's hand and now you got God, you know, you, have, you may have him in your life. <laughs> he may be dealing with you. <laughs> but have you really given your life to him? That means that he has the right to tell you what to do, you see, and how to live, and where you're going to live, how you're going to live, and where you're going to work, what vehicle you're going to drive. That's your life. When you give it over to him, he is in control of your whole life. Amen. But many people aren't doing that. They just, you know, want God as somebody that's going to be there for them for psychology. In the time of trouble, I'm going to go to church and hear a good message to help boost my self-esteem, you know, <laughs> for the next week. <laughs> and that's not God's will. Amen. When God's on the inside of you, you don't have to hear all of those self-help that's right. ministers. God lives on the inside of you. The Lord didn't have to... He, the Lord didn't have pity parties. Does everybody understand? And let me say this since I'm here. Christians shouldn't be depressed. Amen. Not if you have life living on the inside of you. That's right. It don't mean that the devil won't come against you and try to make everything look grim. But if you are in a place where you're supposed to be in the Lord, there's no way in the world you'll get depressed. No way. Let me say something else since we're here. <laughs> if you've gotten depressed, pills won't help bring you out of it. Amen. There's not one piece of medicine or anything else that'll do anything for the devil. You see, you have to realize what's really going on there. You see that. Amen. But when you have given your life to the Lord, and I'm going to tell you where all of this junk comes from, with depression, with folks just feeling like giving up, is because you're trying to live on two different sides at the same time. When you completely give your life to the Lord, there's no room for anything else. There's no room for depression. The only way the devil can get in like that is if you've given him room to get in. You see that? So when you surrender completely to the Lord, you, you know, it, it, it takes care of a lot of the stuff that we go through. <laughs> Amen. I was talking to a sister... Um maybe about four weeks ago and she's a 
psychotherapist, <laughs> and um, she was talking about depression and how, you know, she talked about these pills and, you know, some of um, the patients and even some things that she was dealing with concerning depression and um, how she thought, you know, it might take a while to come out of it. And I'm going to just share briefly, um, you know, with you all who are listening, the very same thing that I shared with her. When I first came to the Lord, I was in a very, very deep depression. And by the world standards, it probably would have taken a long time and some pills and everything else, counseling and all kind of things to bring me out of it. But in one week of um, me reading a book that the Lord spoke to me through, the Lord delivered me from depression. Um, that weight was lifted off of me, and from that day to this, that's not something that I've ever had to worry about overtaking me again. And it was done by the power of the Lord. And so that's my personal testimony that I want to encourage people with that um, the Lord is powerful enough to do that. And you don't have to do things the world's way, and that's what it talks about in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, about not conforming to the ways of this world. Our mind has to be different. We cannot take on the mindset of this world and go by the world system when we call ourselves following the Lord. You know, if we're going to believe him, we need to believe him. And so I'm just here to let you know that, you know, um, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to believe that he's powerful enough to lift burdens like that from us and that we're not supposed to be walking in depression. And it doesn't take years of therapy, counseling, pills, and all of this for you to come out of it. All you have to do is allow him to do it and he'll do it for you. Amen. 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 All right. So now if you have your Bibles, let's go to the 14th chapter of the book of Luke. Fourteenth chapter of the book of Luke. Let me say this, whoever th this portion of the message was for, don't you, don't you stay in that place that the devil have you in. The, it's your decision to come out of there, and you have to want to come out of there. Don't you allow the enemy to keep you there. You see, the people that are depressed by the enemy, especially believers, is because it's your choice. Your choice. Some years ago, I was when I after I first moved up here to Tennessee, I had a pain in my right side, and it hurt me really, really bad, you know. And uh, I, I could barely breathe, and this wasn't, and it didn't let up throughout the day. I woke up with it. And I would have to take very, very short breaths to keep it from hurting me so bad. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if I had broke a rib some kind of way or it just felt like I could barely breathe. You know, it felt like something just had a hold of my lungs or something. And so uh, a relative of mine had called me to inquire of the Lord about something that was going on in her life. And uh, so the Lord gave me a dream the way I was giving her the answer, you know, and, and things like that. So she got her answer that way. But in the same dream, there was, I was uh, sitting in this church, I guess, and uh, had my arm up kind of like this on the back of the bench. And there was a soldier who had his head just piercing into my side. And it was bother bothering me. It was nagging me. You see, and you know how sometimes when you you uh, have a pain, uh, and if you've had it for a little while, maybe a day or two, you learn to live with it. You just go on about your life, and, and women are notorious for that. Now, men, we you get something, you know, the world's gonna know. You see, <laughs> but women, they have a seem like they have a higher tolerance for pain, and so th this soldier was had his head bolted in my side. And uh, I, when I got done delivering the message to the relative that I was supposed to deliver the message to, I looked to my side and he raised up and uh, he said, 
Am I bothering you? I said, no, yes, yes, fine, you're fine. See, you could, because for a whole week I had dealt with that pain. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't going anywhere. And I didn't even think to pray about it or anything like that. I just thought, well, eventually it'll go away, you see. And, and then I thought, you know, well, if it don't go away, I'm going to have to go see what this is. Go to the doctor to see what this is. And so when I woke up from that, I got in touch with the relative to let them know what it was, that, what the answer was from the Lord. But also the Lord dealt with me about what that was. He showed me this person in the form of a soldier representing a demon, a soldier for Satan. And he showed me, I gave that devil permission to do what he was doing in my body just by not commanding it to go. Now, it's just it, it seems simple. But you know, sometimes when you're going through things and you got life to take care of and all these other things that the devil throw your way, you're not thinking about you know, dealing with this other stuff here. Hmm. And so the Lord was showing me, uh, if you don't deal with it, that devil has a right to stay there. Now, it don't matter how much of a Christian you are. If you don't deal with this spirit that's been sent to buffet you, it'll just stay there. Hmm. You see? And so that, that taught me. And that when, when the Lord spoke that to me, when I came out of the dream, I spoke to that spirit right then and it left. Just like that. Just that quickly. Now, the Lord was letting me see what was going on in the spiritual realm. Now, if we could see what was going on in the spiritual realm, we'd be casting out all kind of devils. <laughs> but because the Lord don't open our eyes, we just deal with what we see in the natural. And it causes us sometimes to go through more than what we need to go through and to go through things that we have to go through longer than we have to go through them. You see that? And that's not God's will. That's not God's will. And so we have to, we have to speak. To those spirits. And we have to command them. You see that? We have to command them. And the other night, my wife and I, we went to a fast food restaurant. And uh, what, it took about 20 minutes for us to get our order. Now, the manager was standing right there while these people were slow walking and not doing too much. And he had the authority to say, look, y'all hurry up. But he didn't say that. He just was doing whatever he was doing. And the people were just kind of taking their time getting our order you see that and and what it shows me is you can have all of the authority in the world mm -hmm. Amen. but if you don't usurp that authority if you don't use that authority it won't do you any good mm -hmm. that devil don't care about how long you've been saved <laughs> <laughs> you got a bold enemy mm -hmm. and one that thrives on ignorance. He thrives on it. If, if you can't see that what's going on in your body, what's going, what he's bringing to your mind to torment you is from him, you will just miss it all day long. You'll just be a tormented soul if you don't know that's the devil that's behind it. You see that. You'll be tormented. And so the Lord want us to, he don't want us to be ignorant. The Bible says we shouldn't be ignorant of his vices. And he got plenty of them. Plenty of them. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> All right. The 14th chapter of the book of Luke. And we're going to start reading at verse 15. And when one of them. That sat at meat with him. Heard these things. He said unto him. Blessed is he that shall eat bread. In the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. 
I pray thee have me excused. Now let me say this while we're here. One thing that I I can't. Uh, one of the pet peeves of mine is excuses. I don't like it from uh, our children. I don't believe in excuses. I believe in confession. <laughs> Don't tell me what you did wrong and then why you did it. Because if you can justify what you're doing wrong, you'll continue to do wrong. Mm -hmm. You may have a reason. You may very well have a reason. You see that? But we are held accountable by the Lord of what we do. You see, we're held accountable to him for that. You see, and and so God does not tolerate excuses either. And that's the reason why I don't like them, because God does not tolerate excuses. You may have been born in a bad situation that you don't like. You may have gone through some things that you don't like. Mm -hmm. But the Bible makes it clear when you compare your life to the life that Jesus Christ had in this earth, you, there's no comparison. That's right. You ain't never died for anybody. Especially for folks that hate you. <laughs> Amen. And so, God does not want us having excuses or making up excuses for our wrongdoing. If you're doing wrong, just admit it. Lord, I've done wrong. That's right. Don't try to justify yourself in your wrongdoing because it, it takes away from God being able to help you. God mm -hmm. has the power for you to overcome sin. Now, that, that's part of the... That's part of the reason why the church is in the mess that it's in today. I'm just human. Even preachers will get up and say that. I'm just, I'm a man. And so was the Lord. Amen. But the Bible says he was tempted in all like manner as we are, yet without sin. He told the lady who was caught in the act of adultery, go and sin no more. No excuses. No excuses, you see. And so... When the Lord called these people to, you know, to the supper, they began, he said, with one consent to make excuses. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. So, in verse 18, somebody bought some ground and then wanted to go see it. Which doesn't make any sense because... Normally, you don't buy property without seeing it. And the second one, just as silly. I bought something that I need to work with, in other words, some oxen, and I need to go prove it. In other words, I need to go make sure that they work. They're not lazy. Again, another silly excuse. Just as silly as you buying a car without test driving it. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. And another said... I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot... Now, come. notice, he didn't, he didn't go into detail about... <laughs> he didn't say she's bitter and she can't stand you and so uh, this ain't going to work with the relationship you and I have he just said I married a wife so I, you know I ain't coming <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want you to pay attention to that fact everybody else had a reason look at what the first one says I bought a piece of ground now he didn't leave it there he says I need to go see it the second one said I bought a yoke of oxen. He didn't just leave it there. He said, I need to go test them. The third one just said, I married a wife. You know the rest, Lord. You know how that is. <laughs> need I say more? <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. <laughs> so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. Come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, 
that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Okay, so in verse 21, he says, Go out quickly into the streets and lane, and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. In other words, people who were in very rough circumstances. People who would appreciate this supper that they were being invited to because of their circumstances. And isn't that the truth with how it is a lot of times? Rarely will you see somebody that's everything is going right in their life and then they decide, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. Most time, folks are going through something. Mm -hmm. They have to get to the point where they know they need Him. Now, you are, you're born needing Him. Mm -hmm. But that point where you realize it, mm -hmm. that's when you can give your life to Him. Mm -hmm. You see that? Now, what does this have to do with marriage and putting God first? You won't put God first until you know that you need Him. And, and it takes a wise person to realize Lord, I need you even when everything appears to be going That's right. right. Amen. Most of the time, folks don't call on the Lord until they have come to the realization that they need Him. And so most of the time, we get married. Me and my husband, we're both in church. We're both, you know, doing well. Both have jobs. Bills are paid and everything else. Yes, we, God is first in our life. It's easy to say that when everything is going right. But putting God first also means putting God, God above your spouse. And I'm going to tell you why. Because any doorway that the enemy can use to get you, he'll do that. He'll exploit you. And he knows. Now, he's not crazy. He's a spirit. And, and so, you know... We're not talking about giving the devil credit, but he's, he has more sense than we have. Now, you have to know that. Your, your brain is no comparison to his. And the only way you can resist the devil is by submitting yourself right. to God. Amen. Amen. You see that? And so the devil understands that. And so he knows whether or not we have put God first and he will come and test us in different areas of our lives to see if we truly have. And so these people that God told the people to go out, his, his ministers to go out and get, those were people that realized where they are, what state they're in. Now, here's the thing. The truth be told, spiritually speaking, and I'm talking about in the spiritual realm, you can be rich and have all the money in the bank you want and still be poor. You see? You can have both of your legs and, and run, jog five miles every morning, and spiritually, you're still maimed. You see that? Mm -hmm. and, and also in marriage, you, think, you can think, I got the best marriage in the world. I got a good wife. My life is going good. You know, and that's what the word means when it said, take heed that you stand, lest you fall. You see, it's, it's that quiet before the storm that gets people. It's the quiet before the storm. And, if, and the best way to be prepared for it is just to know you got a devil that you have to contend with. That's all. You see? Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Does everybody see that? Now he's saying if you don't hate, look at what he says. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, and even your own life, you can't be his disciple. Now, he meant what he said. And we got a lot of people trying to be his disciple and trying to love everything the same way they love the Lord. And, and you miss God every single time. You see that? 
And verse 27 says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In other words, take on that spirit of suffering. If you're not willing to suffer, you can't be his disciple. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And we have a lot of folks that's in this condition. Jesus is saying, Which one of you who intend on building a tower will not first sit down and count how much it's going to cost? In other words, figure out, is this something I'm going to be able to finish? You see that? This, in other words, the Lord don't work on the layaway plan. You got to be able to pay it all up front. It ain't no Lord, just wait till the first. Give me grace. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's saying, sit down and figure out what I'm telling you. I'm telling you it's going to cost your life. And you're going to have to love me above any everything else. <laughs> and if you can't do that, you might as well just not even get started. Why? He said, because when you laid the foundation and folks around you seeing that you're not able to finish it, they're going to mock you. You see that? And so we, we have to be careful, you see. That, that, and that's what causes a lot of people to fall. Mm -hmm. It's because they haven't come the cost to begin with. You see? Amen. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulted whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And that's, that wasn't just for the old days in Jesus' day. That's for today as well. Uh, I prayed the prayer before. Lord, don't give me anything that I can't give back to you. I don't want, to, I don't want anything in my possession. That's going to turn my heart from you. So don't give me anything that I can't give back to you. If you can't give somebody a car, your, your vehicle, hmm. when the Lord speak to you and tell you to do it, you don't need a vehicle. Hmm. You see that? And so God want us to count the cost e e even in our marriages even in our relationships look at what he said there in verse 26 if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters he, he covers all of your family members saying if you don't hate these people you see you, you can't be his disciple why because the devil will use those very same people to draw you away from God. You see that? And so God wants us to count the cost. Now, it's not hard to, to understand, you see, what we're dealing with when it comes to counting the cost. If we will look at the Lord's life, how he gave up everything that he had in heaven mm -hmm. for our sake, for our sake. You see that? And, and, and we have to be willing to do the same thing. Lay down our lives for the Lord's sake. That's our marriage. And you may say, well, Lord, I want my marriage to work. But I, I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to work without Him. And it's going to take more than bring, just bringing the Lord alone. Mm -hmm. You see that? God want us to... God want us to follow him wholeheartedly. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Did you have something else you want to add? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go real quick. <laughs> 
Let's go to the seventh chapter of the book of First Corinthians. All right, the seventh chapter of the book of First Corinthians. All right, let's. We're going to start reading uh, at verse one. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not, for your incontinency. Now let me let's just stop right here. Paul is saying for married couples not to defraud one another. That means not to withhold your bodies from one another. Mm-hmm. And I've heard folks say, you know, if somebody gonna cheat, they gonna cheat. You can't stop a, you can't stop somebody from cheating. Is gonna cheat. <laughs> And I've always thought that that was a cop-out. That's an excuse for you to continue to be the person that you are. (laughs) Yes, you can push people away with nasty attitudes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Amen. You sure can. All right. (laughs) (laughs) So, to prove this point, read that last part of that again. And come together again, that Satan tempt tempt you not for your incontinence. In other words, these long periods you have between the times that you're intimate with one another. He said, he says, come together so that Satan won't tempt you. That means that a lot of times spouses stepping outside of their marriage can have something to do with you. It can be you. It's not just, well, they just got it in them to do it. Yeah, but what are you doing to contribute to it? Now, I'm not saying that that's always, sometimes folks just marry people like that, you know, and think if I buckle him down and marry him, he going to straighten up. <laughs> Of course we know that that's not the case But listen You don't have to help the devil out That's right This Bible says because of your incontinency In other words Your lack in your sex life The devil can come in and tempt you And God is not falling for the excuse of, well, Lord, he just need to get saved. I, you know, I just, this is the way I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's got a whole lot of folks in hell that, that said that. This is the way the Lord made me. No, that's the way the devil made you. That's why the Lord came to <laughs> save you. You see that? Amen. All right. (laughs) You're going to say something? I'm just say this, you know, for us women who are believers, I know because I've heard women say this about they use sex to control men by holding it from them and thinking, hey, this is going to get me what I want. The Bible tells us how to act differently. So let us just act accordingly. And, and, and ladies, <laughs> sex is not a weapon. It, it is not meant to to 
for your witchcraft. Amen. Let's go, let's read real quick the fourth chapter of the book of Isaiah. In verse 1. The fourth chapter of the book of Isaiah. And in that day. <laughs> and in that day seven women shall take hold of one man mm-hmm. saying. We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Everybody see that? In the last days. The Bible says that there are going to be seven women to one man. And you think with your nasty attitude, he don't know that? And he said that women are going to be so desperate, they're going to be willing to share men. We live in a day where women would fight other women who they're not in covenant with. But the Lord spoke it back <laughs> thousands of years ago. In that day, seven women shall take one man. Now, well, what does this have to do with the seventh chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians? You think you're going to be able to use witchcraft on him hmm. with your body as if there are not other bodies walking around. You think very highly of yourself. <laughs> That's right. And that's that temptation. Because the same devil that's using you to withhold right. yourself, mm-hmm. he has six more out there. That's right. That's got a better attitude. <laughs> We're going to have to forward my emails to somebody else because I'm sure I'm going to be getting <laughs> emails from, from this. <laughs> you know, but that's what the Word tells us. Amen. Don't think because you've married a man that that settles it. Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to church people, telling them, Come together and be intimate with your spouse so that the devil don't tempt you. He didn't say, well, you know, you're above all that. You saved now. You, we ain't got to say anything about that. Y'all just going to flow in the Holy Ghost all the time. <laughs> He's not writing to unbelievers. He's writing to Holy Ghost filled people. Telling them how to act in their marriages. <laughs> you can't withhold your bodies. Yeah. And unfortunately, many women, and the men, of course, as well, do that and think everything is fine. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 6. But I speak this by permission and not of command. Now, he's saying, I speak this by permission. Now, I think it's very interesting that he says that. Other things that Paul spoke, they were by commandment. God gave them those things to speak. But here in the 7th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, I speak this by permission. And what he says after that is by permission. Let's go and keep reading. For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. See there? Now, how was he? He was unmarried. And he died that way. Paul never got married. So he says, I speak this by permission. That I wish you could be like me. He says, but everyone has their proper gift. Now, here's the thing. He says, everyone has their proper gift. Jesus said when he walked this earth, that some men are eunuchs from birth. God created them that way. They'll never have a desire to marry anybody. Unfortunately, Catholics... With their ministers, they put that on them. Which is why that spirit was able to come in and cause them to do all of the junk that we see them doing today. 
But that's not everybody's proper gift. And Paul makes that clear. Everybody don't have that gift. And if your husband or wife married you, they don't have it either. Amen. Oh, you can't lay hands on them and y'all just, you know, that don't work. God created man and woman, the husband and wife, to be attracted to one another. And ladies, it would break your heart if your husband told you he wasn't attracted to you. But that same mind, you can think, but I can withhold my body from him. You see, all right, let's go ahead and keep reading. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. You see that? All right, now let's jump down to verse um, 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. Yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Now somebody uh, several months ago sent me a question about this. What does that mean? Why, why did Paul say that? Look at what he said there. He said, but this I say in verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. Now, we spend a lot of our lives before we get married wondering who we're going to marry. And after we get married, we hate to think of us departing from one another through death or however. But, you know, unfortunately, marriage is only for this side. It's not for eternity. Nobody's getting married over there. You see that? Nobody's getting married in eternity. There's only one, one groom over there. And his, his bride is the church. You see that? And so, when, even when we get married, now this is what Paul meant. You have to consider the time. If, if you're blessed by the Lord, you may be married for 50 years, but that's nowhere near eternity. Which is why he can say, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. This was his advice to married people. And he didn't just make that advice to, to the husband but also to the wife. In other words, if you have a spouse, when it comes to the things of God, you better live like you have none. Let's go ahead and keep reading. He'll open this up for us. And they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Everybody see that. Go ahead and keep reading. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belongeth to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. So before you get married, if you're serving the Lord, you can focus all of your attention on what God wants. God, what is your desire for me? What do you want me to do? Let's go ahead and keep reading. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Everybody see that? That means that it is only natural after you get married to be concerned about what your spouse thinks. Now, if you're not concerned, you don't love them, y'all don't need to be married to begin with. And what Paul is saying is the enemy can come in 
and use that to get you out of God's will. Everybody see? And that's why he says to those folks that are married, the time is short. You better act like you're not married when it comes to, if it comes down to, you know, your spouse versus what God wants for your life. Which is why he says in verse 10, you see, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the wife, put, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any man have the wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And if, and the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelie unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, do what? Let him depart. No, run after him and make him make it try to work. Make it try to make it work. You see. He said, "If that unbelieving one depart, let them depart." He says, if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, well, God established your marriage and run after them. Why? Because if that's an unbeliever, the, that's a tool of the devil to get you to turn. Mm -hmm. Now, when you put all this together, what he's saying is, when, when it's decided one of y'all saved and the other one's not, and that one depart. Let them go. And if God choose to bring them back, God will do that. But you can't do that in your own strength. That's what it means to put God first. Amen. You have to trust God for that. God didn't tell you, go run after them and make it work. It's not going to work when you're serving two different masters. Amen. And the only way two people can walk together is if they agree. God don't make anybody serve him. And, and you can't make anybody love you if God's not living on the inside of them. Because God is love. You see that? And so many folks, we find that out the hard way. We marry people thinking that, that, we, that love is there. But I'm telling you, if God is not there, then it will eventually come down to what they want, their desires, mm -hmm. over yours. You see that? The only thing that makes us unselfish is God's love itself. Mm -hmm. So he says, if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. Now, I understand this is hard to swallow, but this is God's word. It's designed to keep us from falling into the trap that the devil have set. You see that? And th that's why it's important that we maintain our relationship with God. Amen. Why? Because you can run after that unbeliever. But how do you think that's making God feel when compromise begins to happen? Because that's what's going to happen. Somebody's going to compromise somewhere. And, and I, I can tell you, there's not one person in this world worth going to hell over. You see, we're going to stand before God and, and we're going to answer for that. Yes. All right, let's go real quick. This is where we're close. Let's go real quick to the 12th chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people become bitter in, in relationships because they're running after something that don't want them. And the longer you run after that, the more hurt you become. Well, folks don't mind you hanging around as long as they can use you. And, and please don't mistake 
them using you for love. And folks don't mind being around you as long as it's benefiting them some kind of way. You see. All right. <laughs> Ecclesiastes is a book that was written by Solomon. And he refers to himself as the preacher. And the theme of this book is vanities. Paul said what we read just now in the seventh chapter of First Corinthians, that the time is short. And when you think about time versus eternity, what we do here in time that's outside of God is vanity. You can go get your hair done today. Next week you have to do it again. <laughs> vanity. You can go get the nicest car. You go get a $100,000 car. You still got to put gas in it just like you have to do a $10,000 car. That's vanity. You can go to work, build yourself a reputation, gather all this money in this world, and still have to die and answer to God. That's vanity. No matter how rich you are on this side, on that side, everybody's the same. Now, I know we don't like to hear that. That's called communism over here. <laughs> but there is no capitalism in heaven. Everybody's the same. Everybody's the same value. And it's, it's really that way over here. You're just too silly to know it. <laughs> and so the preacher gets into vanity, what all these vanities are. And so at the end here, let's read verse... 13. Oh, actually, let's start reading at verse 12. 12. Yes. Please ask his 12th chapter, the 12th verse. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Now, how many of us have ever known anybody, every time you see them, they read something that's intended to make them better, other than the Bible? Paul is saying everybody in their mama is going to write a book. I mean, not Paul, but Solomon is saying everybody in their mama is going to write a book. And look at what he says there. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, the whole reason that I wrote this book. Go ahead and keep reading. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's your whole duty. That's the only reason why you were born. Fear God and keep his commandments. Not getting married. Not trying to make your marriage work. When you're trying to do that, you're operating in the flesh. And God will just back up and let you do it and let you find out the hard way. It's not going to work without him. You have to put him first. He says your whole duty is to fear God and keep his commandments. You have to leave the rest of it up to him. That's your whole duty. Everything outside of that is vanity. In other words, for nothing. Let's go ahead and keep reading. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You see that? And so we have to allow things to be the way that they are. You can't make a, piece, a puzzle piece fit where it's not supposed to fit. I've heard people say, I have to make my marriage work. If the Lord is, the Lord is in it and you're putting him first, it, it just flows. When you put gas in the car and your gas tank is full, you don't have to get out and push it. Amen. When you got God living on the inside of you, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. You see that? And most of, and this isn't just about marriage. Most of us, we live our lives trying to do what God is supposed to be doing for us. We live our lives. That's why the word tells us to be not anxious. Worry comes when folks are operating in the flesh. Amen. And that's in our marriage. That's in our homes. That's... In every relationship we can have, when we're anxious about things in our lives, it's because we're trying to do it in our flesh. You see, 
But if we truly put God first, that's what the word means when it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. And all of these things. Put God first and let him worry about the rest of it. Because there's nothing you can do anyway. The law says, which one of you by taking thought can add one hair to your head? Or do this or do that. You don't have that kind of brain power. So if you know that you can't do the small things, why are you worried about the big stuff? You see that? The Bible tells us to submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. The first thing we have to do is submit to him. And by submitting to him, that allows us and gives us the power to resist the devil. Now, in actuality, what is that saying? Pay attention to God. Pay attention to him. Don't be worried about everything that the devil is cooking up over there. If you keep your attention on him and put him first, he'll take care of the enemy. Jesus tells us in this life we're going to have tribulation. He said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He says, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, be of good cheer, you, you're an overcomer, you're going, you're going to do it. I did it. He says, be of good cheer, for I have. In other words, without him saying it, what he meant was, put your trust in me. Put me first, because you can't overcome it on your own. There's no self-help books or anything like that that's going to help you overcome. You see that? All right.